Hello, my name is Woody. Welcome to season four of Change in the House of Pods, a podcast about Deftones. Today, on the 20th anniversary of the release of Deftones' self-titled fourth album, I am delighted to share my conversation with Terry Date, the album's producer. And of course, he produced Adrenaline, Around the Fur, White Pony, and Ohms. And we talk about all of them. And Eros, which Terry has plans for. Oh, buddy. Uh, but before you jump ahead and listen to what Terry Date says about Eros... I want to acknowledge a few folks who've helped me get this season going. Starting with Mercy, who joined me for an episode on season two. You might know her solo work or her music with the band Fleshwater. She recorded a wonderful cover of Minerva for the podcast. Honestly, I felt a little forward asking her for it. I was listening to her new album and just sort of hit her up out of the blue and asked her to cover Minerva for me. And when I heard the song, I'll be honest, I cried like a baby. I was a little overwhelmed. It's just so amazing. As is her new album. It's called You're Alone, uh, and it's wonderful. Thank you, Mercy. And I want to thank Sly Massmeyer, another friend from season two. You know Sly. He volunteered to do some graphic design for this season. And Christina madsen Linner, who I work with at the radio station, who's been creating social clips since episode one. I am genuinely grateful for your help with this season. And I have some pretty cool conversations to share with you this season with a pretty eclectic group of people. Next week will be of particular interest. If you're as curious about Deftones' early days as I am, I talked to their first manager, Dave Park. And that episode will come out on Friday. Episodes will release on Friday again after this week. But today is special. Because today is the anniversary of a most interesting event. The release of Deftones' self-titled. One of my favorite albums of all time, obviously. Uh, It's got some amazing songs. I mean, Bloody Cape. Battle Axe, When Girls Telephone Boys, Needles and Pins, Hexagram, Minerva. That's almost all of them, but I feel like that proves my point. And then there's the iconic imagery from Frank Maddox, the Skull and Roses, which you see everywhere again now that the shirt's at Hot Topic, which is awesome, by the way. I only wish you could get them in little kids' sizes because I would scoop those up for my babies. Uh, but in the story of Deftones, the album has symbolized the dark days or perhaps the beginning of the dark days, and it often feels like an afterthought, particularly as the follow-up to White Pony. But for this Deftones fan, it is as potent and aggressive and moody and brilliant as anything in their catalog. Plus, I just love riding to it. I could ride to self-titled all day long, man, since 2003. It's just got that bop to it. And it's got one of Terry Date's favorite songs. Terry Date. Talk about a catalog, man. Soundgarden, Pantera, White Zombie, Limp Biscuit. For a great conversation about his whole career, listen to the Couch Riffs podcast with Terry. And he shared some terrific stories from his time with Pantera on the Drag the Waters podcast. But uh, aside from an anecdote about Nookie and a short story about Chris Cornell at the end, this is all Deftones here, baby. Are you ready? Well, without further ado, season four begins now. This is my conversation with Terry Day. I was sitting in a room like this at home, um, and uh, somebody named Guy O'Siri called me. And I, you know, I was living up in Seattle. I work out, you know, I travel out of Seattle, but I've always lived here. Guy called me up. I'd never heard of Guy before, but he had a some kind of a presence to him that was was pretty special he just said i've got a band i want you to come listen to can you be on a plane tomorrow and i said yes and just you know kind of cold i'd never really heard of the band never heard of guy but um it turned out to be um a really great relationship on both ends you know guy and the band about when was this 
Uh, now you're now you're. <laughs> I didn't yeah. start the question with "Do you remember?" When was the first record released? Do you 95, remember that? Five ninety five. Okay, so this would have been ninety four ish. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I don't remember what time of year that phone call was, but uh, I'd I'd have to go back and look at my notes to know when I made that first record. Um, but uh, uh, can't remember what time of year it was, but. No, it was probably around ninety four. So About you, yeah, you you fly to L A. to to see a show, or was this a showcase? Not at all. I flew to Sacramento. Oh wow! And I met the guys in a room about a twelve by twelve room, where they were rehearsing. They rode their bicycles to rehearsal, um, <laughs> um, and I went in this room uh just the band and me as i recall probably maybe some of their friends you know some of their crew guys or friends um and they played this set of songs from the new record in this little 12 by 12 they were almost touching each other but the energy was so high you know they were they were bouncing off the walls and each other in there and it was pretty undeniable energy and you know i was hooked right away really yeah what was it was it just this energy was there something about the songs what what do you recall compelled you immediately i i've always based my decisions on who to work with um uh, based on how they would be live i guess you know what their what their live performance would be um there's some person, you know, obviously personality issue issues that I deal with. Uh, that's not the right way to put it. I don't <laughs> deal with personality <laughs> issues. There are person personality issues that I consider, um, you know, mm -hmm. whether I'll be able to, you know, work with them, whether they, you know, will work with me, whatever. That was never an issue with these guys. Right off the bat, we were good friends, um, and uh, the songs you know it was the performance that really really got me this if the songs were no good then it would i wouldn't even have paid attention to the performance but the songs were all really good and the performance just put it over the top in a little tiny room like that they just gave it everything bloody they were bloody i think <laughs> really as i recall there was a lot of blood in the early days a lot of skin wounds yeah so <laughs> uh so what happens next then you 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 talk to the guys you you develop some sort of rapport and was there already was it already uh sort of out there that like all right this is the preamble to us doing this thing uh, yeah i think i don't think there was any question at that point whether we were going to move on and do the record um at, at the time i had finished i was kind of you know, I was kind of riding high. I'd finished some Soundgarden records, some Pantera records, um, uh, some records that had done well. And they were just all excited that they had, in their words, a brain, a brand name producer. Um, <laughs> and so that's what I was called by them for a long time, a brand name producer. Anyway, um, we had no questions going forward. Um, I don't remember how long it took to actually go from that first rehearsal to the studio um i typically didn't do a lot of, we i don't spend a lot of time in rehearsals with a band that's already has their songs worked out you know because i want to catch them without thinking about things too much you know i just want to catch performances so not long after that we we came up to i brought them up to seattle um we worked at a place called uh uh well uh it was called Studio X slash Bad Animals. Um, we did an, a number of recordings there over the years. Um, but this was one of the old, small 70s rooms there. Um, and we, you know, yeah, we just got in and did, we just did a, you know, a band that's full of fire. And, and I tried not to think about it too much. We tried to just capture performances. So. What does that mean when you said it was one of the small 70s rooms? Uh, this studio at the time, it, it used to be a place called K Smith in Seattle, and it was built in the 70s. It did uh, oh some 
some Elton John, some Bachman Turner Overdrive. They were they were small, kind of dryish rooms. You know, they were um, uh, rooms that you know that modern rooms are more alive, uh, more alive, and uh, th these were very you know a lot of stone on the walls and you know paneling, fake wood paneling, and uh, the control. The, they had great equipment in there, but they were designed in the seventies. Um, but that helped us, I think, in a lot of ways, you know, we didn't, it, it wasn't a big, um, overwhelming, you know, kind of, you know, intimidating studio. It was, it was a very comfortable homey place. And I think that helped them feel at home. Um, so, uh, so it, it was, it worked out well. And then we mixed it, uh, the next door to these two rooms, um, Anna Nancy Wilson from Heart uh, and uh, a guy named Steve Lawson, who was also a studio owner. They kind of got together, bought K Smith, and then they built a big state of the art Studio X, you know, big SSL room, big live, huge place, um, which is where I did most of my recordings after that first Deftones record. Um, but we mixed, we mixed that first record there in the, in the, in the big new room was it um was it a pretty quick record i mean they had most of the songs if not all of the songs already um do you have what do you remember about uh them w were they were they one or two takes in those early uh those early recordings um what do you recall yeah yeah well there were a couple things um i don't remember how many takes i mean they were probably pretty quick and you know what i used to do and still do as much as I can is I try to put the whole band in a room and record everybody playing live and then strip it back down and replace everything but the drums. Um, so basically I get the band playing live to get the drummer Abe to, to give us a classic Abe performance, like only he can do. Um, and, uh, so let's see. Um, so I don't know how many takes, but, you know, it was fairly quick. And I think the whole record took about five weeks, if I'm remembering right. But we would go back uh, um, after the drums were done. Uh, and this is all on tape, too. This is pre Pro Tools and computers. So this was like, you know, you get a performance and, you know, you work to get a performance. And then we maybe chop tape between performances, whatever, edit some drums together, but very minimally. So it's just getting Abe to play well. And that didn't take too many takes usually. Um, it was just a matter of how how good do we want to get it because they were all they were all just great Abe fire, you know, is what it was. So we did that. Um after that we would go in and uh, I think at that time I was doing guitar next. So I'd sit with Stefan and we'd do a lot of uh, do a lot of guitar stuff. Um one of the songs uh, we experimented a lot and I forget what song it was, but one of the songs, the heavy guitar was actually one of the assistants uh, at the studio, Tom Smurdy. Um, he had a little practice amp, you know, with a little five inch speaker in it. And we just, we asked him if, <laughs> if he would mind if we used it. He said, no. And so we, we took it and we took the grill off and we took razor blades and we we cut the cone so it would rattle more and stuck it in a, in a room right outside the control room with a 58 on it and compressed it really hard. And that was the heavy guitar sound for Stefan on, on that song. And I, you know, they, they would remember what song that is. I can't remember, but um, yeah, that was, that was good. Um, one other thing about that one too, for as far as uh, after Stefan was done with all his stuff, we would do bass with with Chi, and um, Chi was always you know he was always fun to work with. He was it's hard to talk about old Chi, but um, Chi was um, he he was about the funniest person I've met, and uh, he was he was really fun to work with, but. Um, we would get his bass stuff done and then go into some vocals um, for this first record. Um, Chino, you know, obviously Chino is a very emotional person. Um, 
So we weren't trying to get uh, we weren't trying to get typical pop songs, rock songs, or whatever. We wanted to get pure emotion out of him. And one thing I did was um, I built a cave in that room, just sort of like a huge igloo out of foam with a little opening at the front, just big enough to put a floor monitor in, a wedge. And I stuck him in there with a 58 and um, and he didn't have headphones. He just used that wedge. I just pumped the mix at him really loud out of that wedge. And so he would feel like he was playing live. And, you know, the monitor was comfort comfortable to him. The 58 in his hand was comfortable. And so he, we were able to get performances out of him that way. Matter of fact, on some of the songs, and again, I don't remember which ones, but um, you'll hear feedback, you know, in the songs. And that's actually coming off that wedge into his mic. So, um, but yeah, that though, I mean, his performances were, were all emotion, just so much, so much emotion, especially he always, even to this day is, but you know, when you're, early twenties, you know, that emotion was so strong. Um, and you put him in a little world of his own where nobody can see, he doesn't have to feel self-conscious about what he's doing. Nobody can see him. Um, it just all came out. Wow. I was really eager to ask you, I've been eager to ask you about recording Chino, especially, uh, with adrenaline being, you know, your introduction, your, your first time, uh, with the guys, um, mm -hmm. because, you know, checking out your body of work, the artists, the singers that you've recorded have been these full throated and not that Chino doesn't do that, but he also has those very small moments. And so I was wondering about what kind of challenges that presented in capturing those, the dynamics of his performance, because he can do something that's so small and unassuming and like lulls you into this explosion that's yeah. is that that's how you did it well that's one way um I, there was uh i i almost always with him um and and there are a few exceptions to the rule but i would say 90 percent of the 80 percent of the time whatever it was a 58 handheld 58 right here in his face and so he he you know that's his instrument that's his live instrument and I wanted to get the performance over the, you know, and the sound quality is fine too. But the, the other, the other thing I would do was um, I would use, uh, I would double compress, you know, in a specific way with, with him, usually um, a Yuri 1176. Um, uh, or an LA two to combined, you know, uh, either two 1176s or an LA2 and 1176 put together, depending on what studio I was in and what, what they sounded like. But what I would do is I would set those things so the attack and releases were opposite of each other so that you wouldn't hear the compression pumping so much, but you could get all of the screams and all of the whispers in one performance. I mean, tech hopefully you could get all that it was there was a little bit of work going on there but um that's you know there was that plus we would always put um a little bit of a of a rat foot pedal into his ears and also recording so there's a little bit of distortion rat uh, foot pedal distortion going into uh on his voice when he sang so that uh you know it just feel more intense to him um and usually a little delay or something too there was there's a, there's a couple of pieces of gear that we've used consistently over the years that he felt comfortable with that um we may or may not have used in the final you know mix but when he was singing those were always going on when he was singing because it just gave him it put him in a place where you know he, he was uh, familiar sure Interesting. So you're able you're able to split uh, his vocal with effect and without so that you can have, I guess, a little bit more flexibility to do with it what you need to do. That's so badass. Yeah, well, I, we could um, <laughs> he could you know, he could monitor the effects. Either I would blend it for him or I would give him the capability to blend it. Um, 
typically I would, I think I would do it for him just so we wouldn't, he wouldn't have to think about technology. He could just, you know, tell me if he liked it or not. Yeah. Um, and I would usually record a separate track with the, the effects on it or in the early days of tape when I didn't have the luxury of a million tracks like now, um, I would just write down, you know, settings of what we used when we recorded and then I would duplicate it in the mix if we liked it. Um, if it was super special and hard to get back, we would we would definitely record it then onto a separate track someplace. That's super cool. Wow, that's really that's so cool to think about it as uh, not even like I don't want to put myself even suggest that I am in your arena or in your league. But I do consider myself something of an audiophile and I like to I like to record and I like to mix and it's fun. So hearing you talk about it is I'm geeking out a little bit. It's pretty rad. So uh, so uh, you talk about um, the the finished product. You're you're satisfied with it. Actually, you know what? I think I, I, I feel like I recall at one time reading maybe you saying that you would have done something differently or maybe you weren't satisfied with adrenaline were you happy with the the recording and the results um i mean i this this is kind of cliche and whatever but um you know i'm never happy when with anything when it's done um it usually takes a lot of years for me to appreciate it but the the dirty laundry in there the mistakes you know the things i could have done better drive me nuts but on that particular record, um, and this is probably what you had heard or read before, um, I had just come off Pantera, doing Pantera. And during the, in the early 90s, bass was not, you know, bass, uh, the bass tone in, a, in, a, in those early heavy metal records were not usually uh, a big deal. I mean, they were down there just to give some bottom, but um the uh, deftones guys they chose me because they liked pantera and they liked sir mix a lot <laughs> you know which are two records that i had done so they were very much combined between urban and heavy metal you know or or you know hip-hop and heavy metal i guess a better way to put it so um low end was important to them they they tried to convey that to me when i did adrenaline and we mixed it. I think I missed the low end on that one. You know, I think they all would agree that it had great energy, but if we just had put some more, more balls in it, you know, just beefed it up a little bit, that would have been better. But you know what? Every record I've ever done, I can go back to and say, gosh, if I had just done this. But when you, you know, if you try to go back and redo something because of something you think is wrong, it's always a mistake because it's never the record that you're, you're used to anymore. You know, it's not going to be better. It's going to be different, yeah. but it's not, it's not the original thing. So I find um, it hard to imagine like adrenaline getting a gent remaster with, you know what I mean? Like, like it, it would be, it would ruin the songs. It would, it would change. Would it, would yeah. that sound have even been achievable? uh uh with given the 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 technology you know what i mean like you didn't have you weren't working with pro tools would you have been able to get something that sounded like you know as as <laughs> for lack of a better word as genty as they um can sound anymore like with steph's eight nine eleven strings well yeah i mean we could have done stuff we could have uh they th that first record was all standard tuning also yeah. if i recall so, you know, after that, they started to, to drop D and do more heavy metal tunings, I guess. And then Stefan, of course, started playing a piano for a guitar, you know. <laughs> so but, were, you, uh, uh, were you responsible for the, because they toured with Pantera. Uh, was that was that because of the relationship that they had with you and then they got to know the Pantera guys or what, or did that tour come first? Do you know? Oh, no, the tour was after I'd worked with both of them. Yeah. Um, uh, how how cool I was don't that? No, I do, I don't know. It was probably more of a, a booking agency or label connection, uh, more than it was me say, introducing. I mean, I would talk to both of them. I mean, to both bands about each other, about the the other bands, you know. So, um, and 
those two bands in particular of every anybody I've ever done, I was closer to, to those two bands. And to this day, you know, I'm closer to them um, after all this time than I am with pretty much any other band. There's a few others, but um, I stay in constant contact with all the Deftones guys um, and the remaining Pantera guys. Um, I, I talk to as often as I can. Um, but uh as far as how that tour came about um i don't i can't remember but it was but it was probably label you know probably label doing stuff i i think Pantera did you get any probably... did you get any crank calls while they were out on tour together <laughs> no no but i did uh let's see that first tour who were they who were they it was pantera deftones or somebody else wasn't there Yes, and uh, it's escaping me at the moment, but yeah. Was it Black Sabbath tribute, or is that later? I mean, not tribute, with Black Sabbath reunion. I know I saw a, I saw a, a poster, a show poster of that show, but I can't remember for the life of me. Go, you know the them, you know Deftones and Pantera. I think um, there may have also been a white zombie pantera that's what it was yes it was zombie yeah that's right it was wise who you also were working with at at that same time they were joking about that too because i had worked with all three bands and you know uh, whatever but the terry um, date tour yeah i know there was that uh and that was that was a badass tour sign me up put me on that festival i would i'm ready to go so that was really yeah that was that was good i think there was was it that tour there was somebody was uh, god smack on that no that would god smack uh, no. would have been a few years later okay what do you remember you remember something yeah there was yeah it was i remember the venue and deftones were there and i think it was the same time pantera was there um let's see god smack band from boston see there's this is where my brain starts to stain freak. No, not stained. Uh, Sully was a singer. Sully, well, it must have been Godsmack. That, that, yeah. So anyway, I think they play. I think Deftones played a show at this. It was the Gorge. Uh, it was an amphitheater in Central Washington, about three hours um, east of Seattle. Uh, but they played there, and um, I'm, uh, Chino had been up here uh, in Seattle. We were working on some Team Sleep stuff um near my house here and uh he went to this little town up just about 15 minutes north of where we were working on a day off or before the studio this town called snohomish has a bunch of old antique stores whatever he found this old honda 90 motorcycle like old 70s probably 90 horsepower and he absolutely loved this thing it was like you know little tiny thing engines about this big you know um 90 horsepower uh or 90 cc's whatever motorcycle is um so he couldn't bring it home with him because you know he was flying so he left it with me because they were going to be at this tour or at the show not too long after that and i was just going to throw it in the back of my truck drive to the show and put it on the bus so he could have it on the bus for the rest of the tour. So, which is what I did. And so we were backstage or in the backstage area, big open, you know, area and um, Godsmack guys were there also. And uh, they, I think were touring with Harleys at that time. They carried their Harleys with them on tour. And so they would ride those things around back in the backstage area all over the place. And, you know, they're on the big, and then Chino pulls out his Honda 90 and he was just zipping all through them. They're on their Harleys. He's on his Honda 90 and he loved that bike. Um, Ended up. Yeah. I think he kept it on tour the rest of the tour. So. Oh, that's a fantastic picture. Oh, that's amazing. That's so (laughs) funny. (laughs) Hey, it's Woody for the Hair Restoration Institute of Minnesota. I turned 40 this year, and more than any other birthday, I felt like this year I deserved to really treat myself. And above all else, the one thing that I really wanted to do for me was fix my hair. 
I started losing my hair 20 years ago. It was awful. I loved my hair. Losing it was miserable. I hated the way it looked and having to hide under a hat for family photos. Then I went to the Hair Restoration Institute of Minnesota. They're the number one hair transplant clinic in the Midwest with hundreds of five-star reviews. And getting my hair restored was actually a relaxing experience. It was sort of like a day at the spa. It was no pain. It was really fast healing. I mean, I was back on the air in just a couple of days. Whatever your hair loss, whatever your goal, they have the surgical, non-surgical, and cosmetic options for you. Schedule your free consultation at hrimn.com. That's hrimn.com. Okay, so you finish Adrenaline, and they sell 250,000 copies. Um, They're going to make another album. Do you get the call right away, or is it what, what happens next? I don't remember. I mean, there was no question, as I recall, of me doing another record with them. I was very lucky, especially in those days where I was doing multiple records with bands. And to me, that was like the ultimate compliment sign of success is if they asked me to do another record with them, regardless of sales and all that, you know. Um, but um, I, I, yeah, I, uh, the next record was going to also be done in Seattle. Um, I'm trying to think there's probably there was probably no rehearsal or very little. Um, but I can't remember. I don't remember exactly when their rehearsal space in Sacramento came into the picture. I think it was after around the fur, but, uh, but they love Seattle. They've, you know, they always felt like Seattle was a second home to them. So we decided to do the next record in Seattle. We did it, uh, at a place called, uh, Studio Litho, which is owned by Stone Gossard from Pearl Jam. Um, yeah, Stone's studio. I had been doing a number of uh, records there. It was uh, very unassuming. You wouldn't think that you'd be able to make a record in there, but the performances that came out of there were always really, really special for whatever reason. You know, it was a kind of a little place. There was nothing fancy about it, but um, I always had great success. I, the records I did there always just the something was special about it um can you name a couple a couple of the records the other records that you made there uh now i'm gonna have to think a little bit Uh, (laughs) did the first otep record there i did um oh geez stained i did the first stained record there Uh, um oh it's gonna yeah this is gonna test the old brain cells here for a minute no it'll start start that's great please continue so so um yeah anyway um so we did that there and i believe i mixed it at a studio in la where i mixed a lot of stuff called larabee um i think i mixed that second record there um was a lot of that album did some extra recording there too so you did some additional recording as well that that's what i think the guys reminded me of that at one point um i hadn't i didn't remember because i was i was pretty much working nonstop in those days and so that it was all kind of a blur sure. but um uh, um it's i mean the studio was mainly a mixing room for me but it did have a, have a small uh vocal area and you know i may have done some guitars or vocals in there or something from what I understand, uh, there were a few things written in the studio uh, on Around the Fur, but there or there were at least a couple of songs that they brought to the table. Do you do you recall? I I don't recall which songs, but I always left room for. I didn't want people to write the whole record in the studio, but but uh, I always left room for, you know, when the juices started, the creative juices started flowing. When you're in the studio and you're in that mindset songs sometimes happen um I, that limp biscuit song nookie that that was a last minute you know 20 minute in the studio write it in 20 minutes out of nowhere song no you way know, so th- and there's uh I, I believe we did a song with max from from soulfly and um uh, uh sepultura yeah sepultura. um 
in that studio during those sessions a song called head up and i believe that was spontaneous that was like max came in and we set up everybody live in the in the room and that song that's the song that came out when you said the early days were bloody that was the first recording that i uh thought of because that's sort of an an, uh, an infamous recording session that i believe it was chino left bleeding and it's the the song has so much gravity yeah there was yeah chino and i never argued ever you know or disagreed but when he would get emotional when he would get you know into it it, 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 there was a lot and that song created a lot of we were it, there was something about that particular thing where we were just he and i were just like we argued about something that was completely dumb but we took it to such a high level you know and it was for no reason at all but that's just because that song was so intense there's so many emotions going on there um but I've I have had a good relationship with Max and Gloria ever since that particular recording. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Another recording off of uh, another song off of that album. Um, I'm I'm curious to talk to ask you about uh, is the hidden track uh, with <laughs> with the bong hit somewhere uh, about oh. halfway through the. Uh, uh, before Damone uh, eventually kicks in when 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 you guys are plotting out a hidden track which obviously that sort of thing doesn't happen anymore mm -hmm. um so that I don't know in my mind it in hindsight it makes that even more special <laughs> <laughs> I you know what to tell you the truth I can't even remember that hidden track um I, so it, it was you hitting the bong then <laughs> oh probably yeah <laughs> um I I don't remember, you know, lots of times we would do all these songs and the hidden track would be, would be decided on afterwards label, or, you know, yeah. we would master all the songs. And then uh, lots of times, especially with Chino, I would, I, I didn't have much to do with sequencing of the songs, you, you know, the, of the album. I, I just felt like, you know, I'm not going to tell the band what songs to play live, what order to play their songs live. So I shouldn't tell them what order they want them on the record it's not like we were, we had some, you know, there was some formula we were trying to achieve with putting records, you know, to make, to make them sell better or something. Mm -hmm. It's like, what, well, how do you want these songs to line out? How do you feel? You know, and Chino always had, actually, they all had great opinions on what that was. And um, if there was something that was really important to me, I would say it, but for the most part, it's like, Hey, it's your record, man, do it. You should let it, let it do what you want. Um, and for the most part, they did is. And then as far as that hidden track went, I don't remember, you know, what was the cause <laughs> of all that or what if it was decided when and when it was decided. It was probably decided after the fact, though. We probably didn't. You know, we always did a few extra songs in case of we needed a movie soundtrack or something like that. And so those were they were all mastered and that one was one that probably didn't make it into the sequence so somebody said hey let's make it a hidden track that's my you know that's my guess speculation because i can't remember no that's fair that's fair that's cool that's really it's fun to think about and it's fun to sort of uh that it that it maintains a little bit of mystery yeah. um, but but some of the mystery that i've been hoping that you could dispel or at least maybe um offer some clarity to is how these songs get how they how do they come out my impression and the impression i feel like that the guys often give is that they jam they they play and then the songs sort of come out of that and then you shape an album from there but um, um it, it's the songwriting process is always different with every band and probably with every song but for the most part it's pretty typical you know somebody comes in with something a riff you know something they've got something they want to present and then everybody just kind of messes with it and tries to figure out you know do do we like it do we not like it if we like it let's work with it let's see if we can add to it and it just you know it's in rehearsal it's just sort of jammed out yeah you know? so yeah. it's not like probably not incredibly thought out it's just like here's a riff what do you think 
let's make something out of it. It's really fascinating because the end result, these albums that are so complete, particularly the White Pony, the next one. Uh, well, and and really, I, I think everything um, White Pony forward seems like the purpose was for it to be a, such a complete a collection of songs. Um, so it's really challenging for me to go through that mental process of, okay, how does something just spawn an idea and then eventually you can shape it into this entire thing? Was there, <laughs> how, can you tell me how you did that with white pony? <laughs> well, no, because I didn't, I, I didn't do it. Um, the, you know, the thing about the deaf tones is the creativity is so, um, is on such a high level with them. Um, and uh, the, you know, being able to see something that's already, that that hasn't, that's just started, being able to see the completion of it, uh, or at least have some vision of the completion is really one, is really a gift that they have. And um, when you combine that intense creativity with turmoil, which is what White Pony was, it was at a time when they were blowing up. They were traveling a lot. They were, you know, personal life things, you know, strains and stresses. Um, you know, they're, they're, they were probably, you know, there was just all kinds of stresses in their lives, you know, that every band goes through at that third record, you know, whatever that, that particular time. So, um, there was a ton, that record in particular, there was a lot of arguing. There was a lot of headbutting. And that I think was what stirred that thing, that record in and made it become, you know, and have the emotion that it had. Because there was there was no, you know, that record, there was no filler, there was no mailing it in. Every song had a you know had a definite purpose and um and it was all based on you know on conflict really and i mean when i say conflict these guys are brothers you know this is like these are brothers fighting you know but it was brothers fighting with their fists instead of their mouths now not literally they weren't like swinging at each other but this is this was like uh you know there there was there there was a lot of loud volume in disagreements you know and i mean they again brothers family you know it never was like i quit kind of thing it was you know it was just all the frustration and stress was vented on this and i think a lot of it was because they knew that the songs were good they knew the record was good and they you know they all held a really real you know they were all very possessive of that record and whenever that happens you got different opinions and then 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 sparks are flying so was it was it one of the harder records that you've ever had to make um not really you know i i mean <laughs> I the love thing that. is those guys are friends you know so in spite of all that i mean it's not like I hated going in every day. It's just like uh, I, I spent more time putting out fires. Yeah. And, um, but the studio where we recorded was really good for them. Um, uh, and, you know, the, 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 it was, it was comfortable. Um, it was in, uh, let's see, it was at the record plant in Sausalito, um, or the plant, I guess it was called at that time. Um, it's a, re it's a studio where I had also done a band called Mother Love Bone, um, and back in the early days. And I, I just felt like it would be a good place to bring them for that record. And, uh, we were in the room where that Metallica kind of owned, you know, it was kind of their main recording room at that time um and it was uh it was it was a good good place for us to work but it, yeah definitely definitely was uh there was stuff 
there was stuff, but it, it you know, <laughs> it's never hard. You know, it's never like I got up in the morning going, God, I can't stay. I don't want to go in there. Yeah. I really don't want to go. It's like every day I was excited to go in there yeah. because the music was great. And, you know, in between the battles, there was really fun stuff. There was um, RX Queen. Um, that song started out from uh, at the end of a night. We were all kind of drunk. Um, and Chino loved to go sit on Abe's drums and play his drums. It would drive Abe insane. He hated that. And, uh, so Chino was out there kind of playing some stuff on the drums. So Abe went out, you know, not to say, get off my drums, but he went out and just started grabbing some sticks and started hitting some other parts of the drums just to irritate Chino and to make him so that he couldn't concentrate on practicing what he was practicing. And what ended up happening is they were playing, they started playing these beats together, you know, and, and, you know, Abe was playing like the stand, you know, the mics, or the, the cymbal stands or whatever. And Chino was playing the sides and the rims. Anyway, we, we recorded all that. And, um, uh, and then we took one chunk of it and we just looped it and we processed it a little bit and we just looped it. Um, and let's see, St uh, Chino and Stefan were battling about whether it should be sped up or slowed down. So, you know, cause we wanted to change the tempo a little bit and we had computers at that time. So we were able to like do whatever. Um, so I, I gave that same loop to both of them and they both had like little areas in the studio where they could like demo stuff and kind of write do some practice some writing stuff so i gave it to both of them i said take it to your spots and speed it up slow it down whatever you want to do and um then we'll all listen to it and decide and um of course stefan sped it up really really fast because that's you know that's that's what stefan does and Chino slowed it down and it ended up the slow down version was the one we ended up using. And then, you know, we used the loop and then we added all the rest of the stuff to it. And that's how the song came about. Wow. Uh, so, so the percussion on that song is actually Abe and Chino in that improvised, that improvisational tapping on the, wow. That's yeah, so really, cool. really kind of drunk. And <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the end of the night we were you know done for the night and uh that's that's where that's where that came from yeah that's fantastic and a little shout out to uh the guy who was doing computers for me at that time one of my best friends who uh is he's still with us but he's not with us mentally anymore but um scotty olson he he took that and added some bottom to it, some of the big bottom, some processing and kind of beefed up those, those raw, the raw loop um, yeah. to give them something. And, and then uh, worked on it from there. But so that was the first album then that was recorded digitally with Deftones. Yeah. Um, no, uh, no, actually uh, around the fur was recorded on tape, but I bought the, my first, pro tool system at that time and i don't remember how much of it we used i think we may have backed up everything to it i don't remember exactly but it was a very early version um i was at that time pro tools was just starting to come around studios would um rent it to the bands you know you go into a studio with a tape deck you know and tapes it but if you wanted pro tools the you'd have to rent it in addition to studio time and it was super expensive. And I just said, screw this. You know, I, I said, I'm just going to buy one and uh, I'll, if they're going to rent it, I'll rent it back for half the price and we all win, you know, and, and then uh, I get it paid for. But um, yeah, that was around the fur was the first time we tried, we used pro tools. I had no idea how to use it still. I still don't, you know, I'm still an idiot, but um, <laughs> my assistant on that record, Ulrich Wild, who also uh, assisted me on some of the later Pantera stuff and went on to do his own thing. He's still working. I think he's in LA. Um, 
did static X and some of that kind of stuff. Um, anyway, I, um, I said, Oh, I'm buying pro tools. I don't have time to learn it. Here's the manual. <laughs> I'll see you in two weeks, you know, and so he set up in a, he set up in the back room someplace and just figured it all out and, you know, set it all up. And we, we got it going. And I don't remember how much, how much we used it. Um, I know that around on um, uh, uh, White Pony, not a hundred percent sure, but I'm pretty sure what we were doing at that one is we were we would record everything to tape and then split it and go to Pro Tools at the same time, probably after tape and then into Pro Tools, so we would have immediate use of either one. Um, we probably stuck with tape because I even to this day, I still like the sound of tape better, but, um, uh, we, uh, we probably used, yeah, probably, probably used, um, the tape on, on white. I'm pretty sure we used tape on white pony, but we had, we had the backup, the computer backup. Uh, when I spoke to um, Jeremy Bohm from Touche Amore uh, for this podcast, he said something that was really, he said something really cool about Digital Bath, that every sound guy in every venue across the country checks sound with Digital Bath because it's the perfect sounding song. What, <laughs> what do you, what do you think about that? I think that whenever I walk into a new studio or if I get lost drum drum wise, especially I put that song on just to, just to put myself back into a spot. And I've heard that comment and I'm in, it's like, I mean, uh, uh, you know, it's ultimate compliment to me. You know, I started as an engineer, so, you know, I come from that side of things. So to have somebody say that, you know, this is the way a drum set should sound on tape. You know, that's like the, I, I, there could be no better award or reward than that to me. Um, but that particular one, you know, with drum sounds, real drum sounds like that, there's always, it's, it, it's, it's always a bit of a crapshoot, you know, um, because it's, uh, you got to have the right drummer the right drum set, the right sounding drum set, you got to mic it correctly. The room has to, has to be the right size room for the tempo of the song. And that everything all came together on that one. You know, everything just was the, the, the tempo, especially the intro where he's by himself, you know, um, the tempo, everything, just the room reacted perfectly to it. Um, we had the right snare drum on there, the miking, he was hitting it right, you know, so it just, it was, Abe comes up with those kind of things for me all the time, and I couldn't love him more, you know, because of that. Um, the other one is my very favorite entrance to any record I've ever done, and that's Around the Fur, because at a time when everybody was doing huge, huge, long you know, sophisticated, sometimes self-indulgent intros. Abe comes out with, and then, then, and, and the song starts, you know, and that to me was like, God, that's perfect. So. I love that. That's the uh, Phil Collins, Philip Bailey rip. He, he, he confessed that to that. Um, oh, actually, he? <laughs> yeah. Uh, on a Q and a on Instagram live, he said, Oh, I stole that boom bop from uh, easy lover. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, wow, like incredible. Just such a cool thing. <laughs> um, do you know when songs like that, do, does that give you some sort of an inclination that like, wow, this is going to take off. This is going to be, this is going to be timeless. This is. Um, no, most of the records I do, I have no, I mean, I know that they're fun. I know we're having a blast. I know I love being with the guys, but I don't hear like radio or timeless or anything like that because who knows what people are going to like you know there's only one time and that that was with limp biscuit when they did nookie i i you know i that was that was like oh god this is going to be big you know oh no wait really yeah <laughs> that's outstanding 
Um, yeah, because I was it, I was tag teaming between Deftones and Limp Biscuit through that whole period. Really? You know, uh, yeah, I was. Uh, matter of fact, um, uh, what record was it? Um, it's probably self-titled the one i call minerva but um uh deftones record um well they were doing chocolate starfish well no um it was after chocolate starfish and i believe they were gearing up for the the record after chocolate starfish deftones were gearing up for I think the self-titled record. Pretty sure it it wouldn't have been that self-titled was the one after yeah white uh, white pony right yeah yeah so it would have been that one but anyway they were both in rehearsal and I'm going oh great they're both going to want to start their record exactly the same time and I'm going to have to make a decision you know yeah and uh, sure enough you know that's what happened and I you know I had to. I had to go with Deftones. They were family, you know, and um, and luckily for me, um, the Limp Biscuit record kind of went longer than it was supposed to, and went through a bunch of people. and And then Fred hired. I know this is off Deftones subject, but anyway, Fred hired a new guitar player. He wanted me to come and record a couple songs for the album with a new guitar player. Uh, turned into 12 songs you know so yeah. i was able basically to do both anyway but um yeah i was tag teaming a lot between both of those bands um but again you know um people have asked me sent with soundgarden you know did i know that they would be timeless no because we were neighbors we we're you know we we're just making a record you know it was yeah. fun and you know i you know we had but that was earlier. You you you'd had some experience making some hit records by the time you were uh, doing the self-titled Deftones record. I'm you'd yeah, had a number it, of a number of it, big hits. Yeah, experience is kind of a loose word, though. I think you know. <laughs> um, I I live in the moment, you know, and um, I love it's, that. I man. I just never. I I never was the one uh, the the person who could like hear a demo tape and say this is going to be huge, you know, um, I, I could listen to it and say, wow, I really like these guys. They're going to, they'd be a great live band. You know, there's be a great band. See, but I never would, I never went after anything going, well, if we made this course happen three more times, it would be great on the radio or whatever, you know, um, I just, I just want, I just liked to, you know, make these records that that the that the band needed to make you know and i didn't to the, to the frustration of many a and r people i tried tried to avoid make you know doing anything to compromise the band's vision just for uh, to sell a record you know yeah. which i think is why you know those records lasted so long you know they're they're they were harder to 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 like than you know something that was really obvious on the first listen yeah i yeah. guess but uh yeah i i you know i really was not that great at going oh this is going to be huge i was just i was good at like oh i really would like to work with these guys this would be fun yeah so i love good... that you attribute it to being present and and living in the moment and i uh i'm envious of that as a matter of fact i think that's um that's a skill i don't think that's just something that's that people just do i think that's something that you gotta you gotta kind of work on or at least i feel like i have to work on i think it's just lack of brain cells lack of lack of creativity probably it's like ah whatever <laughs> let's just see what happens i don't know but no i think it it's really uh me not being a musician you know i don't play an instrument right uh oh did you fro oh, oh are no, you okay here. you froze for a second. oh did i i'm back yeah, uh -oh. you're all right okay okay <laughs> uh, i i don't play an instrument so uh it's not like i could you know um you know pull out you know the chord i've been i've been working on for three weeks that you know <laughs> right. nothing to this band um uh you know so for me it's always like what you know i'm a listener i'm a non-musical a non-musician listener i'm a fan who's in the audience just reacting to this music, you know, I'm not analyzing it. I'm not 
breaking it down musically i'm just it's just like a really surface you know neanderthal reaction to you know what's hitting me and that's what i really wanted to you know that's all i really could you know bring to the table was just that opinion you know and um you know my my whole goal was to uh, associate myself with people who were who i felt were good and and you know talented and creative and then my whole goal was to you know step out of it and make sure that they're doing the best they possibly can and um you know that leeway i think put people at ease um and i think um you know it gave them the confidence you know i'm a caddy I, that's what i am i just realized i'm a golf caddy you know i just sit there and i say you're really good you are the best and just hit it just a little left of the flag over there and you'll be perfect you know that's really what you know it's it's really making sure there's no doubt because all creative people have have massive self-doubt you know and uh down deep somewhere in there it's it, it you know and uh so i really felt like my my role was to make sure they that they were you know the confidence level was high how was it going into the uh self-titled recordings had to be had to be pretty high <laughs> I, I, I that was that was not a pun that was i meant like just because of the success of white pony he's right <laughs> yeah. um well um i'm gonna know, edit that out i'm those... gonna cut that out that's for... <laughs> yeah <laughs> funny thing about um about those guys and they'd be the first to admit it they were they they were doing a lot of stuff back then you know nothing i mean to to my site that was you know super crazy but you know probably probably not i don't know i wasn't i was the dad okay so whatever they were doing they wouldn't do around me and mm -hmm. because I, I wouldn't you know i caught them a couple times and they felt guilty but i i'm like you know i'm here away from my family you know i got wife and kid at home uh, kids at home um i i don't have time to sit here while you guys you know are being recreational you don't need that to make this record so you know whatever they did they would do on their own there were a few times on on the self-titled record where i was trying to do vocals and uh or with chino and he would lots of times um you know we would always do the music tend to do the music first for the most part mm -hmm. and then he would just listen to the songs and and kind of start putting syllables and consonants together and then eventually put the words in, in there so there was a process of just looping a song a number of times and so he could just focus on it go into his private room or whatever and focus well on the self-title there were a couple times where i would loop the song 12 hours a day for six days straight no way and um uh yeah and i i i was playing video games a lot but there was um <laughs> he just you know he just wasn't able to do it you know i mean he yeah. there was a he was he was blocked there but i still think uh that record i think that that record still to to me has one of the uh has a song the song minerva that brings more emotion out in me than any other song they've done you know that song you know i'll i'll get a tear in my eye on that every time and i don't know why mm. but that one has you know it's one of my favorite deftone songs just from just from the emotional standpoint i was so, 20 years old when that song came out which coincidentally it's going to turn 20 this summer <laughs> um and it's kind of cool uh it, it wasn't until sometime in this past year i was talking with my buddy miguel and uh we both left deftones and and i had this revelation uh and I, I i said to him you know i don't think that this song 
I wasn't ready for this song when it came out. It wasn't as important to me then because I hadn't, I hadn't experienced enough life. You know, now I have two daughters. Now yeah. I'm, I've, you know what I mean? I've gone through some, some things and now that song, same, same as you, it's like, Oh, that song is a, that song weighs a ton. Like that song. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever heard the, um, the choral version of that song? There's a, 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 a choir that sings it. It's floating around on YouTube. It's, gorgeous if you haven't wow. seen huh. i haven't yeah. heard that huh. i will i will email the link to you so that you could check it out because it's it's a tremendous it captures that spirit and that gravity that the yeah. the emotional emotion of that song it's really it's tremendous yeah um, i think there was a lot there was those the guys were going through a lot during that time again i don't you know unless unless their personal lives were affecting the studio our studio lives I stayed out of it, you know, and if they wanted to tell me about it, they would. I didn't ever ask. Um, uh, but I know they're going through a lot at that time. But at the same time, we we're making that record. We were at Studio X, the big the big room up in Seattle. Um, and, you know, we had a ping pong table out there. We were playing ping pong all the time. You know, Chino was dying his hair and ruining the bathroom with red stain all over the bathroom, you know. It was just kind of kind of normal, but there were there were difficult times there too. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Uh, I'm uh, not sure, but I think they were changing management around that time too. I think it was during that record where we had manage potential managers coming to talk to them up there at the studio. But anyway, it was. Uh, Always fun when the business of music gets in the way of the making of music, I'm sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, it, it, it never was. It was, was not. It was important to them to get to get that out of their brain, you know, so they weren't thinking about it anymore. So, you know, we just set aside a little bit of time and we would have that, you know, whoever was auditioning or whoever was interviewing. Um, they just go into the back lounge while I was doing other things. So it was not that big a deal. So. I love that your favorite song is Minerva. I think that's great. I think that you that you call the record Minerva is so cool. It's fun. <laughs> Obviously, it's great when your favorite band tours in your town, but what do you do when they don't? We travel to see them, of course. And believe me when I tell you, the Hair Restoration Institute of Minnesota is worth traveling for. Hey, it's Woody. I'm lucky. HRI is five minutes away from my house. But if you aren't in the Twin Cities, you are also in luck. With their Hair by Air program, HRI will reimburse your flight, get you to and from the airport for free, and they have complimentary on-site hotel accommodations. Yeah, that's right. There's a hotel attached to HRI. This is literally the best-case scenario if you want thick, flowing hair like a Viking. Or a rock star. Or a lion. Well, maybe that's too much. Check out the Hair by Air program at the Hair Restoration Institute of Minnesota at HRIMN.com. All right, now what are we going to do with this guy? We can't just leave him lying around. <laughs> right? Did you do some work on the B-sides in, in Rarity's album? I did, yeah. Um, probably mixed some of them. I, I'm not sure. I, I forget what's on that record, but... I, I probably did some mixing up at Studio X on that one. And then uh, there was also the uh, Team Sleep record that came out prior to uh, Saturday Night Wrist. And you worked on the Team Sleep record, too. Some, yeah. Um, I can't remember what. I, I know I had Chino up here and Abe came up and did a played some drums. We, we worked at a studio nearby here called um, Bear Creek Studio. Um, and uh um let's see i don't remember exactly what i did on that record i don't think <laughs> i mixed it but i know i recorded some stuff on it so um was there any uh were you involved in any way with the eros record when that was being worked on yes i did the entire i did i did the whole thing i uh, matter of fact i don't know I've still got that stuff. Someday I'm going to, whenever they're ready, whenever they're ready, maybe before I'm going to mix the thing and um, still need some vocals put on it. But um, it's, it's really, that's a record that, you know, very personal to them, of course, because it's cheese last record. Um, 
and uh so it's really up to them what they're going to do with it um i i probably will mix it get it in in shape for them to add whatever they have to add to it and and have it basically done um for whenever whenever they need it that's so that's something that sounds like you've decided upon for a while that that's it's it's you, it needs to come out i well um it's really up to them you know i mean that's that's the thing it's the, it's it's a personal thing to them if they feel like it's it's worthy of coming out then i want to have it ready for them um when the time comes you know but um it really is um it's up it, you know it's it's up to them to decide what you know what happens with that with that record um i'm i'm going to do my part on it so that you know if i get hit by a bus tomorrow at least i've got something done you know got it got it ready for them so um, that's really that's really cool to to hear the especially with the impression being largely that it's not done or that it's not ready or that it's not close enough to complete to put out um but it sounds like you're i don't think any of us have really listened to it sure that much. i mean i know i haven't like sat down and, and dissected it torn it apart um like i normally would you know put it on you know on my stuff here and try and try and mix it so i haven't done that I may have tried at one point over the years, but you know, right now that's on the bucket list for when, you know, when I want to just start documenting some stuff. So well, I look forward to that day. Obviously I'm sure you are uh, aware of uh, how fascinated and um, much fans would, would love to hear it. Not that I'm, suggesting that you know you, you need to do anything I'm, who am i going to tell you what to do uh but yeah that's really no it's just it's up to the band you know it's what yeah but it's it's not you know there's there's nothing uh there's it, it would it would strictly be for them and the fans you know that's all yeah. it would be for and uh who knows you know i don't yeah. i don't know what what they would want to do with it but um it's up to them. I hope you. I hope you get curious after this conversation and you go and you listen to it. I think that would be <laughs> cool. I would love to hear what that's like. Oh, it's definitely. Um, you know, it's sitting there waiting for me. You know, so I'm. I'm just. Uh, it's something that's on. Definitely on my list of things when I want to get going on stuff to do it again. Yeah. So uh, you obviously you didn't make uh, the next. I, four records with them, uh, three, four, and then finally you return to Ohms. Um, how, how, um, again, I've all, I, um, was always encouraging them to, to look around for other people, you know, not, not get locked into me because I wanted them to be able to experience, you know, other opinions of, you know, you know, besides my own, um, and you know it worked well with some, not with others. I think, um, but they kind of went through a number of, I think, three other people, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and we've all we, I mean, we were in contact always, you know, through all of it. And um, you know, like, I, and I talked to Nick. You know, when Nick start when Nick first started working with him, he and I are good friends. He called. You know, we, you know, I told him a few things that I had done that you know, he may want to try, um, or not, you know, he, um, uh, but, uh, after was a gore, I think was the last one before I, before Ohms. Um, I think they were ready to come back and, you know, go back to, you know, what we did in the early days, you know? So, um, and I told him, I said, I'll always do it whenever you want, you know, I'll be around if, you know, but I want you to, you know, to you know be sure you know be comfortable with what you know i want you to make sure that you're doing the best for you know you're doing what the is best for the band what you feel is the best for the band but i'll be there if you need me so and i still will i always will you know whether we make another record or not i have no idea but um i'll always be there to help 
them any way they need it. So I read you said that you were on a mission with Ohms. <laughs> with uh with Ohms. With Ohms? Yeah. Probably. I'm always on some stupid <laughs> journey of some kind. But no, with those, I mean, it was um it was fun. You know, Chino now lives three hours away from me, I guess, by a car. Um and and I have my own place, you know, my own studio here that we did most of that record at. Um, um, and so he was able to just come up and hang out and just kind of work, you know, comfortably up here. So um, that was that that was the mission, I guess. I guess the you know, I I just wanted to make another Deftones record, you know, I just wanted to make another record with my friends. So I'm just glad it was well received. It was too bad that, um, you know, they, they were, they had their, they were packed up um, to go on tour for two years and the pandemic hit, they never left the house. Um, and I, literally the next day they were going to get on a plane and they never did. Um, so it was, a, it was a little bit, of a shame that the record got caught in that but at the same time you know maybe it gave people a chance to listen to you know more of a chance to listen to the record and it got what got two grammy nominations so that's that's you know what what more can you ask for really you know i know that there is probably some recency bias but i have concluded that it's my favorite deftones album i wow. think that they're there's so many wonderful things to love about it. Um, what one of them that I, I want to ask you that I feel like it separates this album from the rest is that quality of the sound that the album has. It's got a a very specific and unique to it's singular. It's it's the sound of ohms. Mm -hmm. How 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 did you how how does a uh, uh, a collaboration come to all right this is the color of this brush stroke how did you figure out like that's what these are going to this 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 collection of songs is going to sound like I, you know it's all it, it's just sort of all instinct you know it's uh um everybody do you know putting on putting in their own opinions um i did use my assistant on this one i've never used before uh, with deftones is a guy named andy park who's very very talented um and helped a lot on this he has a his ear is more tuned toward uh i don't know um sort of a different style of music than mine is so it was a good combination and he and chino got along great and they had a lot of the same musical tastes so um he he was a big part of it all um i think you know sonically the difference is this is the first time we've done anything in my my place which you know right there wow so you know wow. this is where we did all vocals keyboards mix all that kind of stuff um and uh, uh um I don't know. It's just, uh, it, it's a, di it was a different way of working. We were able to just, you know, we weren't paying a daily rate. We just were like, you know, we'd play and then we'd go goof off and go have drinks and we'd come back and record some more, you know? So it was, it was pretty leisurely, I guess. Um, we did, we did drums, bass and guitar in, uh, as, uh, studio B at Henson. Um, in LA and then we brought everything else up here for the rest of it so are, are there conversations that you uh, in in other podcasts that I've listened to to um uh to prepare for this conversation I've heard you say you ask artists a lot about uh their their um the inspiration for the the, the references like who 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 do we who are we trying to sound like or what is the inspiration for this um when you're at this stage in the relationship with Deftones, where do you, how how do you figure out what they're trying to do? Are there, is there, what's the language between you? Um, well, there's a lot. Of, we would, we would sit down, uh, you know, late at night and 
we'd get into this, you know, we'd just get on the computer and I just was thinking of this song. What do you think of this song? Just for fun, you know, and that would make somebody go, Oh, I like this one. And so we would just like play this, you know, I like this song. I like this song, a musical tag, I guess, song tag. And um, so it's just always interesting. You'd listen to those and go, well, you hear how the space, all the space in that song, maybe we could, we could find that same space in one of our songs, you know, we'll try to like find that, or maybe that effect that's in there, you know, I want, uh, you know, we got to try to, you know, get that same effect on this song. So we would just, you know, listen to a lot of different things, nothing, nothing earth shattering, just what everybody does, I guess. Um, but it's usually late at night and then we were just, you know, being, and then we'd maybe put on the turntable, you know, dig out some vinyl. So we'd have something tangible to look at and listen to. And, um, you know, Chino would, would go buy vinyl, you know, he always loved having some vinyl around. And so, um, that's pretty much what it was. Wow. That's so cool. It's such an incredible album. I feel like there's, um, like everybody's at the forefront. Everybody's, everybody's, um, there and it's such a it's such a wonderful experience nine albums in to continue to find you know what i mean that's so special right i mean that yeah yeah i agree I, that is special i mean to even get along after nine albums <laughs> you know and uh after three albums you know to to be in the same room together for any amount of time and these guys do it and they keep you know it, it's just i think a, um fact that they have such diverse musical tastes you know but they don't discount anybody's but they like everybody else's taste you know so um i don't know there's just a lot a lot of that uh yeah i get the impression that the the bond the friendship is what is attributable to the um the career longevity but i I think the musical interest, their interest in their just love of music and listening to different types of music, each guy individually, and what then bringing that together is what drives the creativity. Am I wrong? Um, I think that that's an element of it for sure. Yeah. I, I mean, the love of music is is the beginning of it all, you know, and mm -hmm. I don't think anybody who does what we do um, you know, does it in a vacuum, you listen, you do it because there's somebody that you listen to that you like, and you're trying to emulate it first. And then, then you take pieces of that and do something pieces of something else until it becomes something your own. So the creativity starts from being a, a, a music fan. So uh, the, the way that I like to conclude every podcast is with a request for recommendations, but because uh, of who you are and what you've done, I'm, I'm, gonna forego that and, and ask you if you would just tell me uh about recording jesus christ pose like would you tell me about a, anything about <laughs> chris cornell just uh um boy i uh you know that's a long time ago so i mean i i remember the i remember generalities from that record i remember a few specifics i don't remember recording that particular song you know other than as a big group of songs that we recorded um again um you know those guys are special friends they were i mean we did that we were neighbors you know me and kim lived a block away from each other we'd drive to the studio together um uh chris was a friend you know i mean an elusive friend but he was always a friend right to the end he was the whole band was at the hospital when my first daughter was born. They were on their way out of town to go to Europe, but they stopped by the hospital to see the baby. Um, most of them were at my wedding. Um, uh, you know, they were, we were just like Seattle guys, you know, just hanging out up here. And um, even toward the very end, I was, uh, I believe, mixing uh slayer record um you know the last slayer record and i was at henson and 
uh, I had heard that Chris was across the hall with Brendan O'Brien doing some solo stuff. Um, but I just told the assistant, my assistant, I said, tell the assistant over there to tell Chris that I'm in the building if he ever wants, if he wants to say hello, you know, but I didn't want to bug him. Um, and so I'm sitting in there listening to a mix that I'm working on. Nobody else in the room. I got my head down, eyes closed, just trying to focus on the mix. And I just feel something and I, and I stop the tape and I, you know, I turn around on the couch behind me, there's Chris just sitting with a big smile on his face, you know, you know, trying to scare me basically, you know, it's just, that's just the way he always, he, he loved doing that. Um, but that was the last time we talked for a little bit. That's the last time I saw him, but, um, uh, yeah, that was, that's another situation. That was another massively unique talent, the whole band, of course, um, that I didn't even notice it when we were doing it. I had no idea. You know, it's like, oh, this is fun. <laughs> you know, that's so but, crazy. That's awesome. Yeah. This has been a tremendous, tremendous experience. Thank you a million times. I really, for, for this time here and for all the times that you were present in the room with the record running, that's, thank you. Oh man, it was all my pleasure. I appreciate you being a fan of these guys because they're special, you know, and they're, they're the kind of special that isn't going to get the big spotlight or the big highlights. They're, they're, they're personally special. You know, there's a lot of people that feel like they own them personally, you know, and that's, that's the best best way to be i think for these guys so when i reached out to him i told terry this podcast wouldn't be complete without him you know what he said when he replied what he said just there thank you for being a deftones fan bro i cried like one of my daughters man i'm i'm a crier what can i say thank you terry mr date sir it was an honor and a privilege and thank you for joining me for season 4 it's going to be great now, go listen to Self Titled for crying out loud. My name is Woody. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter. I'm at Woodbra. If you want to talk about my favorite band, hit me up. Thank you for listening to Deftones, and thank you for listening to Change in the House of Pods. Hey, 